will be upon you, Lord, upon you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Do you just feel like taking two minutes and let's just walk in this altar and just worship him for a few? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. It's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you. It's always been about you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, your name is so worthy, Lord. Your name is like a strong and mighty tower, Lord, that the righteous run it into and are saved. I thank you, Jesus, for each and every one here tonight. I thank you, Lord, for those who are not here this evening, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for the things that you're going to be doing in us, Lord Jesus, how you're going to help us to be a better person, Lord. Oh, thank you, Jesus. You're going to help us to be better better husbands, Lord. You're going to help us to be better wives and spouses. You're going to help us to be, oh Lord, better Christians, better servants, Lord. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. You're going to help us to be better church workers, Lord. Hallelujah. Better kingdom builders, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You're going to help us to shine our light, Lord, that men will see our good works and worship you, Lord Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus, that you're going to help us, Lord God, to be a part of your remnant church, Lord. You're going to help us, Lord, to be, oh Lord, a light on a hill, like a light in the city on a hill that cannot be moved, Lord, but a it forever thank you Jesus thank you Jesus thank you Jesus thank you Jesus hallelujah 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 oh help us Lord never to come and waste time Lord but to give you everything hallelujah hallelujah help us to desire the good part Lord thank you Jesus thank you Jesus and that is to be at your feet Lord hallelujah hallelujah thank you Jesus thank you Jesus oh hallelujah 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 Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. For when the praises go up, the blessings come down. When the praise Go on. the blessings come down when the praise is go
just send up some praises right now. You're everything to me. Let's sing. Jesus, you're everything to me. You have provided all I need. When I thought.
Let's just have it. Wanna be with you.
Draw me nearer. Draw me nearer. Nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where the last Draw me
last verse again. So I'll stay. I'll stay here. The night will be. Hallelujah. The our hands everywhere just love him some more hallelujah what a joy it is on the inside praise God thank you Jesus when the house of the Lord can lift up their hearts in sincerity to give him glory and to give him praise we exalt you Jesus hallelujah you're worthy for all our praise hallelujah we are God and God still in charge. Amen. We're going to be approaching the throne of grace. We're going to make our petitions be known. Hallelujah. 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 In as much as we may not have written a quest, but I'm sure in a congregation of this size, there will be individuals that have needs that you'd like to make your petitions be known. So we're going to be praying. And we're going to be praying one for another. We want to pray for our country. Many times they say that the church is so silent. Everybody know what happened in Hanover. Slaughtering it over six lives one night. Amen. Heard about the bombing in Turkey. One explosion, over 100 persons were killed. One snap, 200 in hospital battling. We have a God we need to talk to. Amen. 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 I believe we need to pay attention to some of these things because it speaks much. Amen. You know, our country has borrowed from IMF, and many people believe it's just a helping hand. But it's also a hand that to keep us vulnerable. A hand that keeps us in debt. So anybody can offer us anything. Because we are beggarly. But we have got a God. Hallelujah. One of the things that let me feel so good about the Lord. Is that he said the rose and the thorns have to grow together. And if you know rose and no thorns. You can't identify a rose. If it's not blooming. If you are put it beside the thorn, they all look alike. But when you see the rose 
spring forth and blossom and bloom with thorns around it. That's the church. And it's going to be a praying church. Quite in order, a house of prayer. So I want us, when we pray, we just don't pray for exercising a moment of expression in words, but with a sincere heart. We're going to connect with the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I want us to just join hands right now. We're going to pray for this service. We're going to lift up the name of the Lord. We're just going to have a good time in the Lord. Lord, we come before you humbly. We thank you for the privilege to serve you. You are God and God alone, not only in Jamaica, but in this entire world. Oh Lord, we exalt you because we know in whom we have believed and we are confident your words go before us. And as we pray, Lord, we want to make our petitions be known. There are persons here who have needs that, Lord, we bring them before you. Financial needs, physical needs, hallelujah, emotional strains, educational needs. Oh, Lord, you can provide and you will provide for we're making our petitions be known. Oh, Lord, I pray you may wash us again in your blood. Cleanse us from all defaults. Oh, Lord, teach us of your ways as we continue to absorb your words as we come to the house of the Lord that we can be guided accordingly and slumber not. Hallelujah. And I be the dismay as to the things that are happening around us. Hallelujah. Pastors are being slaughtered at the pulpit. Hallelujah. By gunmen. Where is this country going? But in the name of Jesus, we have a God who is able to stand. Hallelujah. Irrespective of the circumstances. He's not dead, but he's alive. And he's alive in our hearts. His words are true. And whatever words that he has said will never come back not accomplishing that which he had desired. Oh Lord, we, we love you and adore you. Take charge of this service tonight. Let it be you who is exalted. And let every need, oh God, that is presented. Hallelujah. Will there be a response from heaven? The windows of heaven will be open. And doors, Lord, and hearts will be fulfilled. Doors are open. Hallelujah. God, we thank you with all our hearts for what is being accomplished. Thank you, Lord, for strengthening us tonight. Thank you for your words that has really given us the assurance that you are our very present help in the time of trouble. We give you glory. We give you honor. And Lord, as we sing praises to you tonight, let our sacrifices be accepted before you. For we give it to the sincere heart. And Lord, we are determined to go all the way, not to be deterred by the events around us, but stand strong in the Lord, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, just like Daniel. It's not about popularity. It's about your words and obedience to your word. And God, we are going to hold fast to it. Hallelujah. We give you glory. We give you honor. And Lord, as you said in your, in your words, rejoice, I say. Rejoice. And that's what we come here tonight, Lord, to lift you up and to give you the praise. And rejoice, we will rejoice. Hallelujah. With the breath that you have given us in thanksgiving, we give you glory. We give you honor. And we give you praise. And we'll continue, Lord, to listen to your directions. Thank you for hearing our prayers. And everyone say in Jesus' name. Come on, let's say it stronger than that. Praise the Lord, everybody. Please listen as I read First Peter chapter 1 from the New Living Translation. This letter is from Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. I am writing to God's chosen people who are living as foreigners in the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. 
God the Father knew you and chose you long ago. And his spirit has made you holy. As a result, you have obeyed him and have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. May God give you more and more grace and peace. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again. Because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation. And we have a priceless inheritance. An inheritance that is kept in heaven for you. Pure and undefiled. Beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you have to endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show you that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You love him even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward of trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. Praise God, everybody. Let's take a moment and read verse 9 one last time. The reward of trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. This salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know more about when they prophesied about this gracious salvation prepared for you. They wondered what time or situation the Spirit of Christ within them was talking about when he told them in advance about Christ's suffering and his great glory afterward. They were told that their messages were not for themselves but for you. And now this good news has been announced to you by those who preached in the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. It is all so wonderful that even the angels are eagerly watching these things happen. Praise the Lord, everybody. I hope you are understanding as we read. So think clearly and exercise self-control. Look forward to the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your old desires. You didn't know any better then. But now you must be holy in everything you do. Just as God who chose you is holy. For the scripture says, you must be holy because I am holy. Remember that the heavenly father to whom you pray has no favorites. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. So you must live in reverent fear of him during your time as foreigners in the land. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And the ransom he paid was not mere gold or silver. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. But he has now revealed him to you in these last days. Through Christ you have come to trust in God. 
And you have placed your faith and hope in God because he raised Christ from the dead and gave him great glory. You were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth. So now you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters. Love each other deeply with all your heart. For you have been born again, but not to a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living word of God. As the scripture says, People are like grass. Their beauty is like a flower in the field. The grass withers and the flower fades. But the word of the Lord remains forever. And that word is the good news that was preached to you. Praise God. Let's lift our hands and worship the Lord, everyone. choir is ministering as we continue to worship the Lord you may be seated please
Let's stand, everyone. I'd like for us just to go to one or maybe two persons. And I want us to pray for each other. I want you to pray specifically for those individuals or for that individual that they will prove in an experiential way that the God that they serve is a provider, that he's a healer, that he is with them. I want you to pray for that person. Don't hold hands right across the bench. I want you to look at the person and pray that God will prove to them, I am a provider. I am a healer. I am with you without a shadow of a doubt. Let's pray for each other right now.
Halleluja. 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 You are more than enough for me. More than enough for me. Lift your hands and magnify the name of Jesus. You are more than enough for me. Come on, tell him you are more than enough for me. You are more than enough for me. You are my Jehovah everything. You are my Jehovah everything. Hallelujah. 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 The Lord my provider. The Lord my healer. The Lord my shepherd. The Lord my righteousness. The Lord my deliverer. The Lord my way maker. Hallelujah. 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 Ushers, would you come please? We're going to receive an offering. Keep standing, people of God. Remember that on Tuesday at 6 p.m. there is prayer for all the young people. And parents, I'd like you to send out all your teenagers, all our young adults. Let's just come out for a great time of prayer and seeking the face of God as young people of Pentecostal Tabernacle. Amen, everybody. Amen, everybody. On Wednesday, 9 to 12, and then 6 to 8. 30 there is prayer amen and then on friday we just bring our 10 day fast to a great climax with a great prayer meeting here amen in the sanctuary praise the lord everyone remember to next sunday in the evening we're going to be having our regional congress. And so we ask everybody to try to come out. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord, everyone. I'd like for us to try to plan for offering time when we come to church like for us to plan like for us to plan and to think about it and to make a deliberate decision you know just as you plan for other areas of your life and just as you plan for other areas of worship let's plan about giving it's very important. We give tonight because we love the Lord and because he has asked us to give. Lord, we give you thanks for your provision, for your mercies. You daily load us down with benefits. We're giving tonight because we love you and we are inspired to do so. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Our singers and musicians are leading us in worship as we come this evening. Give us unto the Lord. Have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about our trouble. He will hear our faith that's fine. And he will answer our
Down on my knees when sorrow rises, I talk with Jesus. Down on my knees, I promised Him that I would serve Him. Down on my knees. Sorrow rise, I go with Jesus. Down on my knees, I promised him that I would serve him, that I would serve him. No singing. Let's just put our hands together right now. Clap again, let's do it again. Let's lift our voices down on my knees. When sorrow rise, I talk with Jesus down on my knees. I promise that I would serve Him, that I would serve Him down on my knees. I promised Him, I promised Him that I would serve Him. Last time I broke that I was serving, that I was serving down on my knees. Just one last song about prayer. Mm -hmm. For Satan tried to deceive me while I was there.
Aleluia Yes Oh, what peace we often forfeit Oh, what needless pain we bear All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer Praise the Lord, everyone Praise the Lord Just like to say to those of us who regularly come back to service on a Sunday evening that we don't take the sacrifices some of you make to come back for granted and um, we are making a pledge to you we're not going to play around with the Sunday evening service we pledge by the help of the Lord to prayerfully plan services that will be of a high quality. The Sunday night service is not a what left. We're going to treat it very seriously and honor the Lord with it and honor God's people. Amen. So don't come here and think we're just going to throw down something in front of you. We're going to plan it as carefully as any Sunday morning service. Amen. We know some of you come from far. You have work tomorrow, school tomorrow. And it's a great effort. And we're not going to take that lightly. And we could never dishonor the Lord by treating this service lightly. Amen. And I just want to say that I believe that the Lord has put a burden on my heart to teach or preach some messages just on a Sunday night. Just on a Sunday night. I just believe that is so. We're going to treat the Sunday evening services very seriously. Uh, brethren, also, I just feel like for the rest of the year that we should make a special effort, special effort to invite persons here on a Sunday morning and on a Sunday night for service. And uh, maybe those of us who come on a Sunday night I want to start with asking us, bring somebody with you when you come on Sunday. You try and bring somebody every Sunday. Think about it. But not only to bring somebody. I want you to think about working with people. Praying with them during a break time at your office. Scheduling a time when you can pray them through to the Holy Ghost wanted to think about that. You know, there is a government building not very far from here where over the last little while about 14 persons have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They come down here in the days and receive the Holy Ghost. Not very far. Somewhere in the Hero Circle area. So I want you to think about it. I think we need to let the devil know you're bringing it on. We're going to bring it on and you too. We're going to pressure you. And we're not going to necessarily wait for church to see people converted. Amen? Amen? So I'd like for you to do that. But think about too, just inviting somebody to church with you. Um, if you haven't been doing it, let's start on Sunday. Just bring somebody with you. Amen. Praise the Lord, everyone. And, and brethren, I'm not so much interested in gaining members for Pentecostal Tabernacle, you know. I must be very frank with you. I'm interested in 
allowing people to have an experience with God. I want people to have a relationship with God. Some might not choose to stay here, but wherever they stay, wherever they go, sorry, it will be good enough. Let's lift our hands and worship Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. Luke chapter 14, verses 25 to 33 is where we will concentrate on for the rest of the evening. Luke 14, 25 to 33. Kind of just a spin-off maybe from this morning. And there went great multitudes with him. And he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost whether he have sufficient to finish it, lest haply after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Now we have got to decide whose disciples we want to be. We could be disciples of Pentecostal Tabernacle. We could be disciples of Pastor Bartlett. We could be disciples of the United Pentecostal Church and not be disciples of Jesus Christ. Here in this passage, he lays out three conditions for those who would be his disciples. And he says very clearly, if you cannot meet these conditions, you cannot be my disciple. Now, you could be somebody else's disciple or some other organization's disciple, but not my disciple. Now, I think it is important for us to look at what he laid down as the conditions of being his disciple and decide whether we're up to it or not. You may be seated. Please. The call of Jesus Christ to men and women is a call to discipleship. Discipleship is the true calling 
of every member of the church. It is the true function of every member of the church. Nothing more is required and nothing less is expected. It is both the privilege and the responsibility of every member of the church to respond in obedience to this call and function. I think particularly those who were, as we like to say, born in the church have a particular problem with this. Because somehow when you were born in the church, you were a baby in the church, you slept on the church benches. I think there is a temptation for persons like those to think, I have a right to be here. But the call to discipleship is for all of us. As we have been noting in the past few months, the word disciple or disciples appears 272 times in the King James Version of the Bible. How many times? 272 times. The word believers occurs only twice. And the word Christian or Christians appears only three times. And as I have said before, the three times the word Christian or Christians occurs, it was used by unsaved people of church members. The church members never called themselves Christians. I sense a quietness. Maybe it is a holy quietness. Perhaps this indicates that our Lord desires that those who identify themselves with him should not be so much believers or Christians, but disciples. And it indicates further that the task of the church is not so much to make believers or Christians or even converts, as we use the word, but disciples. Discipleship should be the goal of the church in light of the fact that discipleship is what Jesus Christ demands. He doesn't be demand believership or Christianship. He demands discipleship. Of course, a disciple must be a believer. Obviously. But, according to the conditions of discipleship outlined by our Lord, not every believer is a disciple. In John chapter 8, you will read an account of Jesus reasoning with the Jews. And the Bible says, as he reasoned, many believed in him. And he turned to those that believed in him and said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed? He said to those who believed, I need for you to move from being a believer to being a disciple. And the way to do that is to continue in my word. And I am concerned that many of us are not interested in continuing in God's word. In fact, I believe that for many of us, God's word is a challenge. We would rather believe something else. And when we come upon something that challenges what we believe out of the word, we are in trouble. 
And sometimes we can't even believe it. The conditions of discipleship were outlined by Jesus in our text. Three conditions. I'm going to read the entire passage again from the message. Luke 14, 25 to 33. This is how the message renders the passage. One day, when large groups of people were walking along with him, and Jesus, as we said today, seems to do this. He seems to have done this a lot. Whenever he saw the crowd getting too large. One day when large groups of people were walking along with him, Jesus turned and told them, anyone who comes to me but refuses to let go of father, mother, spouse, children, brothers, sisters, yes, even one's own self can't be my disciple. Condition number one. Anyone who won't shoulder his own cross and follow behind me can't be my disciple. Condition number two. Is there anyone here who planning to build a new house? Doesn't first sit down and figure the cost so you will know if you can complete it? If you only get the foundation laid and then run out of money, you're going to look pretty foolish. Everyone passing by will poke fun at you. He started something he couldn't finish. Or can you imagine a king going into battle against another king without first deciding whether it is possible with his 10,000 troops to face the 20,000 troops of the other? And if he decides he can't, won't he send an emissary and work out a truce? Simply put, if you're not willing to take what is dearest to you, whether plans or people, and kiss it goodbye, you can't be my disciple. Condition number three. Now, as I said, you could be somebody else's disciple. You could be a church assembly's disciple or a denomination's disciple, but not Jesus' disciple. These are the conditions of discipleship. According to these conditions, not every individual who calls himself or herself a Christian is a disciple. When the lives of many of us are put alongside the lifestyle that Jesus outlined for his disciples. There is a vast discrepancy. Vast discrepancy. As we said today in the early church, the signs of genuine discipleship involve the commitment referred to by Peter in Mark chapter 10, lo, we have left all and followed you. In our times, we want instant gratification and short-term commitment. Quick answers to prayer. Quick results with minimum effort and very little discomfort. But there is no such thing as easy or instant discipleship. The walk of discipleship may indeed begin in a minute, in a moment. But the first step must lengthen into a lifetime walk with Jesus. He calls for extremely high levels of commitment from those who desire to follow him. Extremely high. No king, no prime minister, no governor, no ruler has ever asked for people to give what Jesus has asked for them to give. It is 
following him is not a walk in the park. Nowhere in his earthly ministry do we see Jesus settling for easy commitment. Not one time. A call to follow Jesus can mean a radical change in one's life, in one's career, and even in family. He's looking for men and women of quality for whom there is no turning back. It's really it, talent and gifts and, and abilities do not mean as much to Jesus as a willingness to make a long-term commitment. That's what he's looking for. People who will stay full course. People who will count the cost. Great multitudes, we are told, followed him. So, everywhere he looked, there was a throng, attentive to every word. They were fascinated by his novelty. They were inspired and challenged by his teaching. The tide of popular opinion hadn't turned on him yet. So, this situation presented him with a unique opportunity to capitalize on the interest of the crowd. The whole of the Jewish nation were longing for a charismatic leader who, who would deliver them from their bondage to the Romans. They were looking for their Messiah. And Jesus appeared to them to be the one who was superbly qualified for the task. All he had to do at one point, was to give a directive for the people to rebel against the authority of Rome, and they would have done it. At one point in time, he perceived that they were coming to force him to become a king, and he had to hide from them. When he fed the 5,000, they said, mm -mm, this is our king, and he had to hide. So, he was popular. What did he do now? What would I have done? What would you have done if we were a leader and a crowd was thronging us? What did Jesus do? Did he flatter them? Did he offer them some persuasion? Did he try to bribe them? Did he perform some spectacular miracle to win their allegiance? He did none of those things. It almost seemed as if it was his intention to alienate them. What he did was to state in the strongest possible manner the exacting conditions of discipleship. The method employed by Jesus is the exact opposite of what is used by the evangelists of today. Instead of majoring on the benefits and the blessings and the thrills and the excitement, the adventure, and the advantages of being his disciple. He spoke more about the difficulties and the dangers that would accompany a choice to serve him. He placed the cost of being his disciple very high. And he never concealed the agony of the cross. Churches are full of people who have been bribed. Churches are full of people who have been told that it is easy. Churches are full of people who are observing standards but have never made a hard commitment. They don't know what the crucified life looks like. They don't have a clue about the conditions of discipleship. No clue.
All they do is sing, he's under my feet. We've got the devil on the run, 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 run. And they're concerned about blooding up the devil and other people. Jesus wasn't in that kind of ministry. He was looking for men and women of quality. Quantity really didn't interest him. Just to have a full house was not what he wanted. He wanted persons who would stay the course. People who had counted the cost. In Matthew 7.21, he gave this very solemn warning. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. As I said, there are three conditions, three fixed conditions, three inseparable conditions for true discipleship that Jesus is not willing to overlook. Unless we can meet those conditions, he says, we cannot be his disciple. And brethren, I'm beginning to believe that Jesus is serious about what he says in his word. I'm beginning to believe that. You know, I'm beginning to believe in the power of the Bible. I hope you don't think that I should have believed that for a long time ago. But I'm really coming to understand how powerful the word of God is all by itself. Without no help from anybody. Three conditions. An unrivaled love. An unceasing cross-bearing. And an unreserved surrender. Unless I can meet those qualifications, I could be a lifelong member of Pentecostal Tabernacle without being a member of the church, without being his disciple. First condition, we'll quickly look at the three of them, an unrivaled love. As far as Jesus is concerned, he wants to have no rivals when it comes to our affections. In Luke 14, 25 to 33, one statement is repeated three times. The statement is, he cannot be my disciple. He cannot be. Be my disciple. He cannot be my disciple. Each time the statement occurs, it is preceded by a condition to which there is no exception. First one is in verse 26. Luke 14, verse 26. If any man come to me and hate not his father, and mother, and wife, and children, and brethren, brothers, and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. He cannot be my disciple. Now, the use of the word hate in this verse has been the cause of some serious misunderstanding. And Jesus didn't mean that we must actively hate them. The meaning of this word as it is used by our Lord is far removed from the normal connotation of the word as it is used today. Because Jesus couldn't have been instructing us in one breath to love even our enemies, but yet at the same time to hate our wife and our husband and our sons and daughters. If you look at this passage in Matthew chapter 10, you will see what he really means. For instance, look at Matthew chapter 10 verse 37. This is what Jesus says. He that loveth father or mother more than me 
That's what the word hate means. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth boyfriend or girlfriend more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth wife and husband more than me is not worthy of me. Brethren, let me tell you something. We have not yet seen tough times. I have said to this church, and I'm going to say it again, before the Lord comes, we are going to go through intense persecution. It has started in the West. It's been happening in the East for a long time, and we didn't take note of it. We didn't even pray for them. When we hear of Christians being killed in Muslim countries, we only say, oh my. Well, it's coming. Don't think we are going to be left out. It's going to get much tougher than it is now. And we will truly be able to differentiate the men from the boys. I'm not praying for persecution to come, you know. I just know it's going to come. The Lord has told me this a long time ago. And I've been saying it to you. See, Kim Davis there. There's going to be a lot more. The disciple is a follower of Jesus Christ whose love for him is greater by far than all other loves. When a clash of loyalties arise on this point, the disciple's love for Christ will cause him to choose Christ again and again and again. I love you, but I love Jesus more. If we can't do that, he says you cannot be my disciple. If your wife or your husband or your son or your daughter or your brother or your sister or your friend has the ability to pull you away from me. You're not ready. Not to be my disciple can be a disciple of Pentecostal Tabernacle. Can be a disciple of Pastor Bartlett or the church board. But not my disciple. Listen. Mark chapter 10 verses 28 to 30. Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. Listen to what Jesus says. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake, and the gospels, but he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions. I told you, and in the world to come eternal life. But here's what I want us to think about Jesus is saying it may be necessary for a man. For an individual, for my sake, and the sake of the gospel, to leave husband and wife 
and children and brothers and sisters, even houses and land. I might call upon you. It might be necessary in this struggle. Because if they are pulling you away from me and my will for your life, leave them. Don't go to hell with them. That's how serious it is. Jesus was a big promoter of family. So we know that these are extreme cases. He's saying to us, you must love me so much. I'm saying to every wife in this building, every husband, don't allow your spouse to carry you to hell. It's possible that there are people don't allow your father or your mother to carry you to hell. Don't allow your children. There are some people that have sold themselves to work evil in the church. And you might be married to them. You might have them as children. Don't go to hell with them. Leave them. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Don't compromise your love for Jesus for anybody. In the struggle, love Jesus best. You must be able to look at the person that you love dearest and say to them, no, that is not right. Can't go along with you with that. You could be my best friend. I cannot support you. And if it, the friendship ends, so be it. Have to honor God. I love you and I cherish our friendship. But if it is going to cause me to do that which is wrong, the friendship will have to end because I'm going to honor God. Let's lift our hands and worship Jesus. I do not want to be misunderstood. I know how the devil operates. Don't leave here and say because you and your wife have a fuss. You must leave them. I know how people will allow the devil to mess up their minds, you know. Pastor said, I'm talking, I'm talking, Jesus said, Jesus said, two qualifications for my sake and the gospels. Can't separate from your wife because she's miserable. Because that is the property of women. When, when I am dealing with people in premarital counseling, you know, and they come to me, and I normally ask them, what is the greatest fault that you find in this person? And I always say to the men, don't tell me that she's miserable, for that is common to women. Tell me something else. Can't leave your husband because him don't talk as much as you want. Because if you find a man, ladies, that talk more than you, don't get married to him.
So I'm not talking about that. I'm saying that if a person is going to damn your soul into perdition, leave them. If they are causing you to sin, leave them. Don't compromise with your love for Jesus. You're something else. Jesus says, you have to hate your own life too. Don't love yourself more than me. That's probably the hardest one. Because all of us love ourselves, you know. Many of us, our love for self is unhealthy. But we love ourselves. And God is saying, don't spear yourself. Love me more than you love yourself. If you can't do that, you can't be my disciple. But I'm just telling you what the Bible says, you know. Don't hold your life. Paul said, I don't count my life dear to myself. The only use my life has is to live it for Jesus. If I can't do that, my life don't have no use. So we see that there are cases where a man might have to say to the wife that he made a vow to say, look, this is not going to work out. You are determined to do evil and I'm not going to be a partner. Wife might have to say to her husband, mm-mm. Not me. I'm not staying here while you conduct your life like this. Let's lift our hands and worship the Lord. Unrival love. Second one, an unceasing cross bearing. Whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. That's Luke 14, 27. That's the second one. We've been over this, brethren, in order to understand that. You would have to go back to the day in which Jesus lived. Bearing the cross does not mean bearing some common trial or hardship. It does not mean putting up with an angry boss, having a physical handicap, or dealing with an unresponsive spouse or a rebellious child. It is not having a difficult family member and saying, well, I just have to bear the cross. No, that has nothing to do with the cross. There are many people who don't know Jesus at all that have to deal with that too. So that couldn't be the cross. Crosses. <laughs> Tri trial and crosses in our way. The hatha, the battle, that is the crosses. That's not the cross. Crosses. The cross. It has to do with the cross. If your boss hates you because you love Jesus, that's the cross. If your husband hates you because you love Jesus and treats you bad because you love Jesus, that's the cross. But if it's because him love rum, come home drunk, that's not the cross. Holy for unsafe wife have to deal with that. That's not the cross. Crosses. Everybody have to deal with that. Crosses is what everybody have to deal with. If you if you walk in 
And you step on a banana peel and drop. You no know, say me have to bear the cross. That is just crosses. Just go to the doctor and patch up your face. Nobody says the cross you are carrying. Mm -mm. These circumstances are the common lot of all human beings, saved or unsaved. Cross. See, to the Jews, crucifixion was a familiar sight. When Jesus spoke about bearing the cross, the disciples would have pictured, in their minds, they would have pictured condemned criminals going up to the hill with a beam. That's what came to their mind. They were walking to their death. They knew that the cross was a cruel instrument of execution and that to be crucified meant agonizing suffering and slow, exquisitely painful death. The apostolic church needs to understand that the meaning of the cross has not changed. Jesus said you must be willing to deal with it or you can't be my disciple. You have to deal with the ridicule. You have to deal with the reproach. You have to deal with the suffering. You have to deal with it. For my sake and the gospels, deal with it. Don't be ashamed of me. He's not excusing even his best friends. John was in prison. In prison. Devil began to play tricks on John's mind. John, the one who pointed him out and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Take it away, the sin of the world, who was so sure, no sins, and say, are you really the one that should come? Or should we look for another? And Jesus did the work of the Messiah and told John's disciples, go back and tell John what you see. And while they were running up, Jesus called them because they are not finished with you yet. Tell John, blessed is he who is not offended in me. Hold your mind together, John. Don't get Satan. Not because I'm not operating the way you think I should all the time. Hold yourself together. Don't let me be an offense to you. Because if you can't confess me before men, I'm going to deny you before my father. Don't be ashamed of me because you don't want me to be ashamed of you. Some of us can't even walk with a Bible because it's not cool. We don't want to be seen with a Bible. Let me tell you what A.W. Toza wrote. He said, The old cross is a symbol of death. It stands for the abrupt, violent end of a human being. The man in Roman times who took up his cross and started down the road had already said goodbye to his friends. He was not coming back. He was going to have it ended. The cross made no compromise, modified nothing, spared nothing. It slew all of the man completely and for good. It did not try to keep on good terms with its victim. It struck cruel and hard. And when it had finished its work, the man was no more. Jesus is saying, if you can't deal with the radical transformation, you can't be my disciple. What did the cross mean to Jesus? 
It was something he took up voluntarily, not something that was imposed on him. It involved sacrifice, suffering, and death. It involved costly renunciations. It was symbolic of rejection by the world and death to self. It is to cross-bearing of this nature that the disciple is called. It involves a willingness to accept being unpopular and even excluded from society for Jesus' sake. It means taking the right decisions in public even when it is not politically correct to do so. It means being willing to say on TV homosexuality is wrong. It is sinful. And understand that you're going to become a target after that. It is having the ability to say abortion is wrong. Whether Mr. Obama is your friend after that or not. If the Christian is unwilling to fulfill the condition of an unceasing cross-bearing, our Lord states, you cannot be my disciple. And finally and quickly, an unreserved surrender. Verse 33 of Luke 14. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath. All that he hath. All that he had. He cannot, he cannot, no maybe, he cannot be my disciple. As we noted, the message renders this verse as follows. Simply put, if you are not willing to take what is dearest to you, whether plans or people, and kiss it goodbye, you can't be my disciple. And ultimately, Jesus is going to target that. Ultimately, he's going to have to prove. He, he's going to have to know. Did Jesus really mean what he said to be taken literally? Did he really mean that I must be willing to give up everything? Yes. Yes, everything. Everything. What more? Would God really ask Abraham for? Look at what the man had given up. Left his country. Left his relatives. Left his own father. Went to a country that he didn't even know of. And still God says to him, I want more. Want more. Take your son that I promise you. And kill him. Kill him. Prove to me. Want that. And believe you me, Isaac was dead as far as Abraham was concerned. When Abraham was coming on the downswing, if God never called him two times, the first time God ever called him two times. Don't go like this. Abraham! Abraham! <laughs> I'm going to take the dearest thing I have and give you because you ask it of me and I can't withhold nothing from you. The Lord said to Abraham, now I know. Now I know. God speaking as a human being to Abraham. Now I know that you love me. Now I know. Because you have not withheld the dearest thing to you from me. Let's stand. Hard for us. Hard for us to give a little money to Jesus. If you can't look at 
all your plans and all your possessions and kiss goodbye to them if Jesus asks you. He said, you can't be my disciple. So I want us to think about it, brethren. You know we're not getting emotional tonight. As we close, I want you to think about it. Do you still want to be his disciple? Are we willing to love him best of all? To hate mother, father, wife, husband, sister, brother, children, and our own self? Are we willing to deal with the cross and all that it demands? And are we willing to surrender everything to him? Are we willing to give up everything? Those are the conditions of discipleship. If we can't answer the call, then we're not even qualified to enter the university of Jesus, you know. Can't enter discipleship school because those are the conditions. Anybody here, you've heard it. Anybody here still want to be his disciple? I will give you all. I will give you all. If all is what you ask of me. Tough word, tough word. And if I God says, Sylvanus Free, I want you to stop working at the water commission. If he says, Neville Richards, I want you to give up your job at South Camp Road. If he says, John Mark, you can't pastor no more. If he says, Odin, you have to stop putting the shot. want you for something else. We must be willing to say yes. Let's sing it one more time. that is willing right now just to walk away from that relationship because you want to be his disciple here that you're willing to walk away from it, to give it up, surrender it, whatever it is, 
so that you can be his disciple is there anybody here you love your wife more than you love God you love your children more than you love God All is what he asks. Are you willing to walk away from the messed up life, from the dabbling in sin, from the compromise, from the scheming, from the trying to fix it your way? brethren more than keeping rules talking about conditions of discipleship not Christianity not believership all those who want to make a commitment to discipleship and you're willing to meet the conditions and the conditions were not set by John Mark. I'm just telling you what they are. Or reminding you, you knew them already. Or should have. Those that want to be disciples, lift your hands up and worship Jesus. And all of us know we're going to need the grace of God. Can I invite you to come to the altar? Those who are serious about it. God spoke to Abraham. And offer as a sacrifice to the one you love. Lord, is there not another sacrifice that I can bring? Oh, but if that's what you want, dear Lord, then I'll give you everything.
cross and be willing to say anybody else you just talk to the Lord like I said there are persons in the church who have sold themselves to work evil and there are those who have decided I will not allow the word to affect me I have decided on my course of action already don't pay attention to them you look to God for yourself talk to Jesus
Brothers and sisters, as you pray, remember that God will give you the grace to do his will. Remember that those of us who have the Holy Ghost, we have Christ in us. And what we have spoken about is what he wants to accomplish in our lives. And if we allow him to do it, he will. It's not a one-day event. He will do all these things for us, and he'll do it by his grace. Let's just be willing to cooperate with him.
I will not withhold And if my sacrifice Is less than giving you My very best be remembered, Calvary's cross, be willing to say yes. I will give you all. I will give you all. Oh. That's what he has all. I will not withhold. And if my sacrifice is less than giving you my very best, help me remember Calvary's cross and be willing to. Oh. 